I'm Gola Rahaneri. I'm a dermatologist with Kaiser and a clinical instructor at the University of California, San Francisco, and I have the honor of speaking with Professor Belsido about the allergen of the year. And I'm Don Belsido from Columbia University uh, in New York City and section editor for Allergen of the Year in the journal Dermatitis. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, my first question is that what prompted uh, the choosing of formaldehyde as Allergen of the Year? Well, formaldehyde is a very ubiquitous chemical in the environment, and about 7% of patients patch tested by the North American Contact Dermatitis Group have a positive patch test. But recently, it's been questioned whether our concentration of 1% aqueous formaldehyde is the appropriate concentration for use in patch testing, and some European groups are recommending 2%. So it was to call attention uh, to the readers of dermatitis and other interested individuals that there is a question as to what concentration is most appropriate. Currently, the North American Contact Dermatitis Group is looking at both 1% and 2% to see what is best. So we should not uh, expect any recent changes until you're done with further information about them. Right. So it's a two-year cycle. We just began that cycle in 2015, so it really won't be until 2017, at the earliest possibly until 2018, that the numbers are crunched and there's a recommendation that comes forward. You mentioned that um, the estimated prevalence of formaldehyde reaction in the U.S. is about 7% which seems to be significantly higher than Europe, which is roughly about 2 to 3 percent. Um, how do we explain that? Um, it's very difficult to make an explanation. First of all, the 7 percent are patients being patch tested, so it's not prevalence across the United States. Um, it could be we're exposed to more formaldehyde, formaldehyde releasers. That's not clear. Very interestingly, uh, the fragrance industry is doing a consumer uh, habits practice analysis in Europe and in the U.S. So we may get a sense from those studies as to whether the American consumer is using a different type of product more likely to be uh, allergic to formaldehyde. Another possibility is simply that in Europe, people seem to have greater access to patch testing. Socialized mm -hmm. medicine allows for greater access because patch testing is expensive. Um, many insurance companies in the U.S. limit the number of patch tests that can be put on. Um, and so it may be that the patients where patch testing are more likely to be allergic to a given material. Mm -hmm. And it's not exposure at all, it's simply selection bias of our patients, or it may be right. something totally different. Thank you very much for that. Um, the other question I had was about um, current U.S. regulations and formaldehyde use in personal care products. Okay. Currently, the U.S. has a regulation of 2,000 parts per million on formalin, okay, which is 37 percent formaldehyde. Mm -hmm. So it's 750 parts per million. And it's actually not based on sensitization. It's based on the fact that at least in, in animals, uh, formaldehyde can be a nasopharyngeal uh, carcinogen, as reported. Uh, however, it, it appears that that carcinogenicity is due to irritation and not a genotoxic effect of the formaldehyde. It's, it's purely a chronic irritation of the nasal mucosa. It has not been shown to, to necessarily be a carcinogen in humans. Mm -hmm. But the restriction was based on that. Not necessarily the hypersensitivity. Right. Um, are we foreseeing any restrictions being imposed in, in, in the near future? Or? No, formaldehyde was, was recently re-reviewed along with methylene glycol because of issues with irritation in uh, various keratin hair straightening products. And the decision was made really not to reopen or change our recommendations. However, what was brought in was the idea that methylene glycol in water mm -hmm. is in an equilibrium with formaldehyde. So methylene glycol was brought into that report, as, uh, and the same restrictions apply to methylene glycol as formaldehyde. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a question that I ran into that, and I really appreciate your comments on it. Any role for dietary exposure to formaldehyde in patients who have who have been formaldehyde reactive? I think that that is, is very controversial. 
Um, we reported a case of a, of a woman uh, many years ago who, with a formaldehyde allergy, um, who uh, was told actually by her pharmacist that aspartame was metabolized mm -hmm. to formaldehyde. And um, she gave up drinking diet soft drinks with aspartame. Mm -hmm. And she had a uh, periocular uh, and facial dermatitis that did clear. We witnessed that. However, uh, when we wanted to re-challenge her with aspartame, mm -hmm. she declined that. So, uh, and uh, there was a lot of um, editorial comment back mm -hmm. to uh, us, uh, the, the resident who wrote this with me, Michelle Hill, uh, both pros and cons. Mm -hmm that aspartame was metabolized or it was not metabolized to formaldehyde. So I don't know the answer to that. Beyond that, um, you really don't see formaldehyde, formaldehyde releases in food substances. And then, um, do we expect any changes or are there any studies ongoing for, uh, like parallel studies to evaluate the potential changes in the concentration of test materials for formaldehyde release in preservatives? Yeah, there are, there are no ongoing studies for that. The, uh, the current concentrations have been in effect for years. Mm -hmm. um, the only study that was ever done with the formaldehyde releases is for a very long time the North American group tested them both in water and petrolata. Mm -hmm. And it was determined that uh, again, as with uh, true test versus uh, fin chambers for formaldehyde, there was a subset of people who reacted to the uh, water material but not the PET, mm -hmm. and a small subset that reacted to PET but not water. But it wasn't statistically significant, and so we made the decision to go with petrolatum as being a more stable allergen for the formaldehyde releasers. Mm -hmm. Of course, for formaldehyde, it's aqueous. And we will continue to do that. Yes. Um, another contra almost controversial issue is that the use of formaldehyde releasing preservatives in patients who are who have been formaldehyde reactive on their patch testing. That that is difficult, and I think it's really an individual decision that has to be made between the physician and the patient. Personally, if I have a patient who reacts to formaldehyde, but none of the formaldehyde releasing preservatives on my tray. I will give them uh, two options, one to go completely formaldehyde free mm -hmm. and another not restricting formaldehyde, uh, pre releasing preservatives, uh, but restricting any other allergens that they're allergic to. They can make the choice whether they try and want to be formaldehyde free or not. Mm -hmm. If their dermatitis fails to resolve then I, and they've elected not to be uh, free of formaldehyde releasing preservatives mm -hmm. and I ask them to go back to the conservative list. Mm -hmm. And then I will allow them to introduce a formaldehyde releasing preservative every six to eight weeks. I typically start with the lower formaldehyde releasers like imidazolidin, urea, diazolidin, mm -hmm. urea. Quaternium 15 is the last that I release mm -hmm. because it tends to be the higher uh, formaldehyde releaser. Thank you very much. That was extremely helpful Thank you. for the questions I have. If you have any other comments, we would appreciate to have them. No, I think that formaldehyde is, is difficult. It's, it's everywhere. It off-gasses in carpets. I think it can be very difficult to track the source of sensitization, and it's very difficult in, uh, for a patient to avoid. Mm -hmm. well, we wish them luck in controlling their dermatitis, yes. and I really thank you again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.